very good evening to you all here this is dr reddy shekhar reddy on behalf of the english language teachers association of india shortly called as eljoy i take the privilege to welcome you all to this evening for the webinar session 72 we have with us today a resource person dr prantik banerjee associate professor department of english hislop college nagpur to enlighten us on the topic is something burning oil literature and hydrocarbon a catchy title an inquisitive title so we can we can enjoy the session of uh, benerji so and we have with us the moderators for the day dr vaibhav sabnis and uh, who is from baba saheb ambedkar memorial college of law dhule maharashtra and we have with us dr hanmant kumar pochil uh, from late anna saheb audi dore arts and science college dhule maharashtra uh, before introducing uh, the topic uh i request all the participants uh, to watch the video of eltoy
Thank you all of you for watching that short video about Eltoy. Now I take the opportunity to welcome uh, today's speaker, moderators, and all the participants across the globe to participate today's webinar. Now I welcome Dr. Vaibhav Sabnis, who is going to moderate the session along with the Hanuman Patil. I request uh, Vaibhav sir to take over the session to introduce the speaker and uh, take part of the session. Over to you, sir. Sabnis. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy Sekhar Reddy. It's a great honor for all of us to have a multifaceted personality as a resource person today. Dr. Prantik Banerjee from Hislop College, Nagpur, Maharashtra. Sir is a person with manifold interests. He has administrative experience as the vice principal. He, is, he has worked as the NAC and IQAC coordinator as well. His expertise and areas of interest are culture, cultural studies, film theory, medical humanities, memory studies, trauma theory, etc. He has been invited as a speaker in various international and national seminars, conferences, etc. He has been an expert on various academic bodies like BOS, etc. Sir has many research publications to his credit. He has published five books, eight chapters in book and 41 research papers. Sir has been famous as a poet and short story writer as well. He has won many awards and he has been recognized internationally. He has won CLR Best Fiction Writer in 2021. Such a wonderful personality we have today. And he's going to talk on a very innovative topic. Is something burning? Oil, literature and hydrocarbon culture. So we are very much eager and excited. We are e equally curious to know really what is burning and what is the correlation with among oil, literature, and hydrocarbon culture. I, on behalf of Eltai, on behalf of all the participants, I invite Dr. Prantik Banerjee to have deliberations on this topic. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sabnis. And uh, thank you, Dr. Reddy. Um, thank you, Dr. Sabnis, as well as uh, Dr. Heyman Patil, the two moderators of today's session. And a very good evening uh, to all the participants uh, for today's webinar hosted by Eltai. Um, <laughs> yes, there is a bit of a, uh, there's a bit of a, uh, what should I say, excitement about, um, you know, the very topic uh, that I intend to take you with me today is something burning. Uh, is something burning oil literature and hydrocarbon culture? Let me straight away jump into my uh, talk. Uh, uh, friends, my talk will focus today on something that is, uh, if I may say so, something that is inflammatory, something that is incendiary. I mean, it is a subject, oil is a subject which is, of course, a combustible subject, one that easily, one that easily fuels passions and um, and ignites very strong reactions. I mean, think think of what you did recently, very recently when you woke up uh, to find in the newspaper, the government announcing another hike in petrol price. Uh, <laughs> if you were like me, you probably would have dashed off to the nearest petrol pump to tank up your vehicle before, it, uh, before the price hike got implemented. So, um, <clears throat> You know, if I said that petroleum, if I said that petroleum and its products have saturated, if they have fueled and if they have driven our lives, I mean, it would seem to be uh, stating an obvious truth. I mean, there is no gainsaying the fact that uh, our everyday life is saturated. It is infused with uh, hydrocarbon and petroleum products. In fact, um, this is what you see on your slide is an award winning documentary, which sort of gives us um, the rather scary prospect that given given the prodigious way in which the prodigious way in which we are exhausting our oil resources, 
this documentary takes up the rather nightmarish scene by asking the uh, uh, shocking question, what happens when we run out of oil? Because as this documentary says, right in the beginning, that oil is our God. Oil is our God and we all, um, we all worship petroleum. And very appropriately, it's called the crude awakening. Obviously, with the pun on the word crude. Yes, friends, our lives are saturated in oil. It is, um, you know, it is the most, it is the most significant resources, resource of our, uh, our modern capitalist, consumerist lifestyle. I mean, think about it. Oil is everywhere. I mean, it is ubiquitous. And yet, paradoxically, uh, it is also invisible. I mean, when I say that oil is everywhere, it, it, you know, it is, it is oil that determines how and where we live. It is oil and its hydrocarbon products which, uh, which decide how we move, how we work, how we play, what we eat, what we consume. Oil is also heavily, heavily invested, heavily invested in the shaping of our political, social, economic and uh, physical landscapes. I mean, to think about oil is, you know, to think about oil is not just to think about automobiles. It's not just to think about derricks or spectacular spills or spiraling prices, barrel prices. I mean, even the computer or the phone on which we are connected today is, uh, if we have not realized, is, um, is made out of material from oil. So in a sense, you know, in fact, without oil, you know, without oil, the well-oiled levers of, our, of today's world system would collapse. As is often the case when there is a sharp fall in, the, uh, in, in its production or when there is also a steep rise in its price. Indeed, it's, it's no exaggeration to say that our modern culture is a hydrocarbon culture or, or as um, um, Stephanie Lee Man Manager uh, a very prominent uh, energy humanities thinker and critic and scholar says that we live in a petro culture. So in my talk today, uh, what I propose to do is to examine uh, the rather hidden and sometimes not obvious, uh, obvious relationship between literature that literature has with energy sources. And uh, I'll try to uncover the not so visible, the not so visible intersections between uh, between petro, be, between petroleum, pet, petro and hydrocarbon cultures and oil writings, and also the critical, try and unearth or excavate, excavate the critical discourses embedded within this matrix of oil, petro culture and, and, uh, and literature. So I'm going to run my talk, I'm going to run my talk uh, fueled by, uh, <laughs> fueled by some intriguing questions for you and me. One, think for a moment, is oil simply a material resource? Or does it possess cultural capital? Think for a moment, what is the relationship? What is the relationship between, uh, between what is called oil encounter? That is the encounter, let us say, between the global north oil consuming rich countries and the global south oil producing countries and fiction and fiction think about uh, you know does does an inquiry does even to think about these uh, embedded relationships these uh, uh, subterranean relationships about oil's visibility or invisibility in text would that change our critical reading practices the way we read literature the way we read the culture Think about will you know will will new energy driven interpretations, for example, of texts of certain texts of oil narratives or petro narratives, will they will they possibly reveal hidden con hidden conflicts, not so obvious but hidden conflicts of race, hidden conflicts of colonialism, post colonialism, and oil capitalism. Or take for instance uh, this hypothetical question. Uh, and because we all are language teachers and literature teachers, think for instance, uh, 
what happens when we rethink our entire literary timeline, you know, the, the, entire, his, the entire history of literature, uh, not by ages that we are wont to do, uh, as in 18th century literature, 20th century literature, nor by, if you think of literary timelines, nor by the history of ideas, uh, you know, romanticism, classicism, uh, modernism or postmodernism. But think what would happen if we were to consider the entire history of literature in terms of a timeline which is determined by energy sources. Energy sources meaning what is the connection of writings in different eras uh, to that of to to the production, to the extraction, production and cons and and consumption of let's say wood, of tallow, of coal, of um, of oil, of solar energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean these are these are, you know, uh, these pretty much, and I mean, the, the list is exhaustive, uh, the list of questions that one, one, that one can actually pose in order, to, in order to examine and interrogate the deep meshed connections between hydrocarbon, oil hydrocarbon culture and literature. So what, I, what these questions actually open up is, the pos is open up for you is the possibility of a very fascinating interdisciplinary area of studies, which I will talk about in a few minutes from now. Uh, clearly, you see, friends, um, oil's investment, oil's investment in the way in which um, uh, we lead our lives has now become so overwhelming that it has led to the growth of what, as, uh, as the slide says, what is called a, a hydrocarbon culture or a petrocarbon or a petroculture. And herein lies the paradox. Herein lies the central question that I'm going to try and address in today's talk is, you know, this, in spite of um, oil's permeability, oil's diffusion into practically all aspects of our life, and, and also it's controlling, it's absolutely controlling dominant, or uh, you could call it a hegemonic power in shaping our hydrocarbon modernity or postmodernity, I find uh, many, many critical thinkers and scholars have, of course, observed, made the same observation that its importance, oil's importance has found very little correspondence uh, um, in, in, cultural in cultural expressions, in imaginative expressions, uh, uh, in, in literature, not just in literature, but other, but other narratives, for example, in films, in, uh, in documentaries, uh, etc. So oil's discourse, a fundamental premise to my talk really is that uh, oil's discourse has been, you know, it, it has been limited. The narratives about oil and, their, and its influence in shaping our, our life, our culture, as well as our, lit, as our literature has been sort of limited to only, you know, techno-industrial discussions or discourses in techno-industrial circles or even in green debates. Yes, certainly in green debates over... Uh, over oil's role or petroleum's ro role in sort of uh, in contributing to an ecology that is that is getting increasingly imperiled. But the point again, the fundamental point here is that it has oil has no narrative presence. At least it's not had a very very obvious narrative presence in uh, you know any kind of mainstream any kind of mainstream literary writing. I mean, till till the nineteen eighties, other than a rare exception. Other than a rare exception, like um, like like this American writer uh, Upton Upton Sinclair's novel by the same name, uh, the it was called it is called Oil, uh, which was published nearly four decades, six decades back in 1927. So, you know, compared to what we call the great themes of literature, or themes worthy for serious literature. Worthy, worthy as subjects to be taken up by writers of serious literature, such as war, uh, partition, emergency, or disasters, illness, and pandemic. Uh, petroleum, petroleum has uh, played a rather muted role in the field of literary studies, both in its writing as well as any kind of criticism. In recent decades, however, uh, you know, it has oil, oil oil or writings on oil has gained considerable traction as a cultural capital and has become an important trope in cultural narratives and therefore i thought i'll talk on something that is that is still being birthed 
the birth of a new kind of new genre of writing or what you would call energy writings or hydrocarbon writings. So, um, I mean, it's if, if you look at the, the last three or four decades, you know, uh, hydrocarbon writings on hydro, not just writings, I mean, the whole petroleum culture, for example, is finding more and more very innovative and cultural expressions in, in, many, in many forms, in many narrative forms, even including fiction, non-fiction, films, documentaries, and other art forms. Fiction writers, fiction writers, contemporary fiction writers in the last 3, 4, 30, 40 years have found in the power and diffusion of oil a very rich source of themes, a very rich source of tropes and symbols and even narrative and even narrative techniques. So one one wouldn't be off the mark to suggest that the treacle of oil has spilled to literary writings, spawning a genre, spawning a genre called petrofiction. So which brings me, you know, which brings me to take up how the term uh, petrofiction came into being. Uh, let me see. <laughs> I hope my slides are moving. Yes, yes, it is moving, sir. It's go moving? On, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's gone. <laughs> because the last thing you need is uh, a talk on oil and petrofiction and not to move. <laughs> All right. Um, so how did the term petrofiction actually uh, come about? Um, it, it, many of you, it's, it's, I think many of you would already know, it was Amitav Ghosh. It was Amitav Ghosh um, who coined the term petrofiction. In fact, he was writing a review Way back in 1992, he wrote a review on a Saudi Arabian, uh, on the writings of, on the novels of a Saudi Arabian writer named Abdul Rahman Munif's uh, novel called Cities of Salt. And he titled, uh, the title of that essay by Amitav Ghosh is what you see on your slide. It's called uh, Petrofiction, the Oil Encounter and uh, the Novel. What is this essay about? <laughs> well, it is in this essay that Ghosh, famously and very controversially, you know, provocatively, well, not controversially, but you could say provocatively, uh, laments the lack of fiction, the lack of literary writings, which sort of engage or address with oil and its concomitant dimensions, its, con its influence, its concomitant influence on, on, on life, society and culture. And this is where he terms, he terms oil encounter. He, he, he finds that the dearth of writing on oil, particularly in American fiction, is something that he finds is hard to believe. The lack of interest, in other words, the lack of interest, Ghosh finds that the lack of interest shown by American novelists in engaging with something, you know, something that uh, their own history and culture has a very long and rich and long and very exploitative, not rich, but a long and very exploitative relationship with the fates of uh, let's say, peoples, peoples and populations in the Middle East as well as in Africa. Remember, as you know, as teachers of literature, when we talk about the great, we talk about American fiction, American literature, and what comes to our mind immediately is the great American dream. And the great American dream literally moved on the hot wheels of Ford, of Henry Ford. So when we think of an, when we think of the myth of American dream, you know, um, a myth and a dream that, that thousands, hundreds of writers in American fiction to which have contributed to the mythos of the American dream. I mean, American dream itself was a kind, was a form of life. It was a lifestyle. It was a lifestyle, lifestyle, which was triggered, which was, in, which was sort of, um, yeah, it was encouraged and inspired by automobility, the automobility, as well as the self-sufficient single family uh, aspirational homes. And so, and therefore the American dream in American literature friends, I find is, is if, you know, I, I would contend is absolutely inseparable from the rise of petro, petro, petro industry in America in the, in, uh, during, you know, from the 1920s and the 1930s, especially after the Great Depression. But without going into that, uh, coming back to what Ghosh was asking, you know, that why, why when there is so much to write about petrol, why is it that this encounter has proved so, 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 so imaginatively sterile? And Ghosh off offers in that very, very uh, uh, polemical essay, he sort of offers multiple reasons. And, uh, and he says, and I'm going to, and to quote him, he says, to a great many Americans, to a great many Americans, oil smells bad. 
it reeks of unavoidable overseas entanglements or worrisome foreign dependency, economic uncertainty, risky and expensive military enterprises of thousands of dead civilians and children and all the troublesome questions that lie buried in their graves. And then a couple of lines later, he goes on to say that to make things still worse, the absence of oil in American writing, he says, begins to smell of pollution, pollution and environmental hazard. It reeks, it stinks, it becomes a problem that can be written about only in the language of solutions. And clearly, uh, both the problem, Ghosh capitalizes the problem, the P of the problem, as well as the S of the solution, clearly, you know, finding a resonance to something like the Holocaust. So in the essay, friends, Ghosh uh, establishes a rather a very fascinating and historical parallel between the spice trade of the 18th and 19th centuries and the oil trade of the 20th century. But with, dif with this difference, with this difference that, and this is the difference that he points out that makes the argument of his essay, uh, that whereas the spice trade, you see, had inspired a rich body of writings, of European writings, right from the seven, right from the 16th century onwards to the from the time of, you know, Vasco da Gama's uh, travel to Europe, um, something, something similar has not really happened with the discovery of oil, or rather not with the discovery of oil, with the exploitation of oil by, by Western powers, by the discovery, by the, exploit, by the extraction and exploitation of oil by Western powers, particularly in the Middle East and in Northern Africa. So he says there's, there's been very little literary output from this outpouring of oil. So it is as if, he says, it is as if the history of oil is a matter of embarrassment, verging on the unspeakable, the pornographic. I mean, if you have been following the news, even in today's paper, uh, Ghosh himself has, uh, you know, when he talks about literary writings that have emerged out of uh, the spice route, well, in today's Times, uh, Times of India, uh, uh, there's a long, there's an interview with Ghosh uh, about his uh, about his recently published book called uh, "The Nutmeg, The Nutmeg Curse: Parables for a Planet in Crisis." Uh, Ghosh himself uh, is a writer who followed who follows or practices what he preaches. So he followed the polemics of that essay by not remaining silent on oil. In fact, um, you know, in his once again, in his very provocatively titled second book, uh, many of us would have written his second book of nonfiction, you know, The Great Derangement, The Great Derangement, which came out in 2016. Um, you would remember that Ghosh deplores our instability at the level of literature, at the level of history, at the level of culture, at the level of even politics. He, he sort of castigates the instability as well as it's called the great derangement as well as the insanity the insanity of human beings collectively of the human race collectively to to sort of um, uh, not being able to grasp grasp the scale and the violence of climate change that is being caused by a hydrocarbon economy So when I said, you know, Ghosh is somebody who has not remained silent on oil, it's not just in his nonfiction that we find that we find narratives about oil that he has taken up, that he's engaged with <clears throat> the, detriment, the detrimental and deleterious effect of oil on society, on environment and on people. In fact, um, in one of his early books in the Circle of Reason, he actually provides a critique it may be read, it should be reread as a critique of global oil capitalism. I mean, and this is an aspect that, that even, you know, that even uh, Ghosh scholars have not really paid uh, 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 sufficient, sufficient attention. Uh, of course, while oil in that novel, in the circle of reason, while oil is not central to the plot, yet the thematic and structural motors of the novel are fueled by oil, especially if you those of you who uh, who have read Amitabh Ghosh or who have done even who are research scholars of Ghosh, I mean, you will remember that the second section, the second section of Circle of Reason is titled uh, Rajas or Passion. And uh, it is in this section that Ghosh takes the story forward to sort of uh, to to uh, 
uh, to a fictional oil emirate uh, that he calls uh, Al Ghazira in the Middle East and shows how the shenanigans of a US oil company destroys, completely destroys the life and culture of the local populace. So apart, I mean, if, if one rereads the, re the novel, I mean, apart from being a scathing, a scathing indictment of oil capitalism, Circle of Reason also highlights the misery and sufferings of, you know, this huge, uh, of migrant laborers, migrant laborers uh, from Asia to Asia to the Gulf what I would call a sort of petro diaspora. So the circle of reason friends uh, may be considered as one of the early examples of contemporary petro fiction in fact. And that is something that much scholarship is not is not even alert to. Well, um, in recent years, as I said, the lack of oil fiction that Ghosh lamented in, in his uh, essay, essay on the oil encounter so many years back. I mean, it has found quite a literary repost. It has found, found uh, uh, a, lit, uh, a literary repast, and the intersection, the intersection of petrol, of oil capitalism, and oil politics has drawn the attention of a number of writers from across the globe, especially from those places which are called, uh, you know, the hotspots of oil extraction and conflict. I mean, these writers have written specifically focusing focusing their narratives on oil encounters, either for either for grounding, either for grounding oil conflict. As, um, as as the central trope of their narrative or sometimes have used it as a backdrop or or as a as a as a context and these new new crop of writers these new petro fiction writers uh, you know have not have not, are not just located in the united states or for that matter even the middle east in fact from all parts of the world particularly i mean they uh, uh, let me Yeah. What you see on the slide are representative examples of what I call the emerging fiction, the emerging genre of uh, petrofiction. And as you would see, as you would notice from the title of these uh, title, as well as the name of the writers, you know, uh, uh, the Ni I mean, uh, the Nigerian author Helen Habila's, uh, you know, oil on water is uh, is one of the foremost examples of fiction taking headlong, head on, uh, the terrible consequences of, of oil of oil encounter in Nigeria ever since uh, ever since uh, its oil rich reserves were, were started getting started attracting the attention or rather the greed and the profit making agenda of Western oil oil companies right from the 1960s to present day. So. The, Helen Avila's, for example, uh, Oil on Water is, is, is that sort of novel which kind of examines uh, what happens. It, it's, a, it's an imaginative repost, it's an imaginative narrative which, which takes up the question of what happens when a multinational company joins hands with, uh, with, a, with a corrupt local government to extract oil with, com with complete disregard to the people and the environment. The second title on the slide is uh, Cities of Salt. Again, uh, this was the this was the book whose uh, whose review in who in uh, on the in in the review of which he used the word uh, Ghosh used the word petrofiction, and it's a quintet series, uh, of course translated from the original uh, into English and uh, written by the Saudi Arabian novelist uh, Abdul Rahman Munif. And it is in, in this novel also we you know we witness the first encounter of American American oil company officials with a local Bedouin with a local Bedouin population and the subsequent the novel kind of traces the subsequent uprooting of, of the indigenous tribe of the indigenous population um, who until the arrival of the company officials were living in perfect harmony with their environment. So it, it kind of such kind of narratives, of course, have the familiar have the familiar smell, if I may say so, of all post-colonial writings. Texaco again, Texaco written in 1992 is uh, written by this uh, French author Martinique and Bon, uh, Patrick Chamosse. And uh, here again, we see it's it's a novel which kind of uh, focuses on on the resistance of a of a local population of Martinique against the state and local oil cartels called Beques. So 
there are there have been I'm, I'm, i mean what i put on the slide is just a representation of some of the titles that are making news within the genre of petro fiction there are many more uh, one has only to google and you will find that there are uh, more than a dozen other titles that that will come up on the page so the point is that these uh, you know these these examples of petro fiction is and this is crucial have have emerged from different parts of the world to constitute to constitute a literary subgenre uh, with a specific aim, um, a uh, you know, a sort of a shared concern, a shared concern to reflect, to engage with oils, with oils' deleterious effect on society, on culture, and on environment. Therefore, one may say that the questions posed by Ghosh in his essay on the invisibility of oil in writing written 40 years back or 30 years back is now becoming urgently and in and very urgently and very consciously is being addressed by a new crop of writers so if you ask me uh, what really what really comprises you know this um, what could be the standard markers or the characteristic features of this new genre of petro fiction well uh, this is this, the points that are put on the slide are self-explanatory what is interesting is for, for new scholars, research scholars who want to fee, enter into the field of energy humanities, which is again, like it's a broad field and interdisciplinary field, or to, to specifically to look at petro writing. Um, you know, it is a recuperative, it is an empowering project. It is also a recuperative uh, project because it recuperates to 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 uh, to to study petrofiction or writings on petroleum is to recuperate oil histories petro petro histories histories of colonization for example and the impact the impact of uh, of years of uh, oil exploitation on colonized people such kind of writings would also focus on on let us say the uh, you know, on what Western oil companies, mega oil companies like Shell, Exxon, or Mobil, uh, what they have done in uh, third world countries, uh, almost like, uh, you know, one would examine the, the power, the, the extent, the operation of the power and uh, exploitation of these oil companies in a sort of neo imperialist, imperialist with a neo imperialist uh, agenda. So what these, um, you know, what petrofiction together as a genre does is that it places narratives within the context of what may be called, uh, what I call petro diaspora. Petro diaspora, because part of the subtext, part of the narrative theme is uh, to 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 foreground the forced migration of people, of people, of of sometimes entire populations as cheap labor, as cheap labor in the larger flows of, uh, you know, transnational. Uh, transnational oil capitalism I hope my slides are moving yes sir it's moving uh, once again I, I mean uh, the visibility of oil the visibility of oil as a narrative theme is, uh, is there it you know is there in many many media narratives uh, it is gaining more and more prominence and so what i found while i was researching for the talk is what i've put on the slide uh, it has uh, you know uh, when we talk about oil narratives oil by oil narratives i don't just mean uh, fiction and non-fiction narratives uh, take for example um, uh, there's some fantastic work, some very fantastical uh, environmental activist work that is being that is being done by uh, by environmental artists, including architects and uh, architects and, uh, and and photo and photographers. And so, uh, the one that you see on the top corner of the slide is actually uh, an installation. It's it's called an oil installation. It has a title called it's called the London Mastaba the London Mastaba, and um, it's basically a pyramid. What you see is almost like a pyramid-like structure uh, made of oil barrels, oil barrels, and it's called the London Mastaba. And it was installed very recently, a couple of years back, uh, right on uh, 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 Serpentine Lake uh, in Hyde Park in London. And then, of course, you have those uh, eye-catching and absolutely searing photographs uh, by this very famous uh, uh, photographer, 
duo of uh, Edward Wotinsky and Ed Kashi. And in popular culture, popular culture, popular, popular literature, in fact, offers you uh, many of us who have uh, grown up reading Tintin comics uh, would remember this particular title, or one of the titles called uh, uh, The Land of Black Gold, The Land of Black Gold by Hershey, the famous Belgium uh, 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 comic writer, comic artist. What I mean to say is, uh, you know, this is again a sort of a sample to, to illustrate that oil's invisibility, maybe three decades or four decades back, is gaining more and more prominence, given the fact that we are talking about we are living in an age which has become more and more peril, in peril by climate, dis by, uh, by climate change, global warming, etc. And pet petro narratives or petro testimonials are emerging in various shapes and forms through different media and in different modes of media. Now, if you, the larger question, therefore, is that if uh, if we are if we are living in an age of hydrocarbon culture and uh, petroculture, therefore, is popular, including popular culture, is taking up issues, uh, foregrounding and highlighting many of the issues that we talk about in terms of environment and so and global warming. Uh, what really is the purpose of these? Um, varied petro narratives of what use of what uses petro fiction um i would say that you know the whole discourse the whole discourse on petro culture and petro literature is something that adds value to what uh, this very famous uh, uh, green critic lawrence buell says he calls it toxic discourse It is important that, you know, writing, writing more and producing more narratives about petro culture is important because it keeps the eco, eco critical discourse alive in interrogating the many issues related to oil, you know, its colonial past, its neo colonial present. In, in, in highlighting the greed and the machinations of mega companies, uh, the destruction of local societies and cultures, the replacement, their replacement with uh, commercially driven business economies, uh, the exploitation of natural and human resources, the forced labor migration and displacement of populations, all of this, by taking up these issues as subjects of imaginative and thematic treatment, petrofiction in a way energizes our interpretations, energizes our engagement and our interpretation of oil's effect on, on cultural production itself. Petrofiction would, it, it asks us to discover, you know, uh, the processes by which embedded, embedded narratives of energy have created both dominant uh, bo dominant narratives as well as counter discourses and which is more important i feel alternative discourses or counter discourses counter discourses or counter cultures which actually have to change the way in which uh, we think of being and imagining in the world friends the new energy narratives make visible the so called the so-called the so-called natural necessity of oil to our functioning social systems and crucially crucially uh, you know what petrofiction or petro writing would do is to bring out the many entanglements in often invisible often in invisible often hidden sometimes even erased the many entanglements of people culture and nature in a modernity that is being increasingly called hydrocarbon modernity so in the least, therefore, my, my argument is, in the least, our reading of petrofiction and our understanding of hydrocarbon culture ought to lead us to pose the right questions, to pose right questions in the area of literary and cultural studies. I mean, does literature, for example, uh, shape and shift in accordance with the dominant, in accordance with the dominant forms of uh, uh, energy forms uh, uh, of the era, of the era it, uh, it registers? Does literature, might literature somehow play a role in, uh, in reproducing, in reproducing or resisting both in, in advertently or consciously a predominant energy culture? Or to take up a question like how does, how does literature use, uh, use energy and vice versa? What happens as, um, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as another 
uh, as an energy critic calls her. You know what happens as Patricia, Patricia Yeager, Patricia Yeager, she says, what happens if we sort text according to the energy sources that made them possible? What happens, as I said, if we sort of reach out the entire literary, re uh, in entire literary periods and make energy sources as a matter of urgency, uh, uh, urgency for literary criticism? I mean, think, pause for a minute and think again. I mean, can we think, for example, of modernism outside oil electric, outside of an oil electric production and consumption? Can we think of realism? I'm talking of literary ages. So can we think really of realism or realist literature without thinking of steam or coal? Can romanticism be thought of without wind or water? Or is it even possible to think of modern literature, you know, to think about certain kinds of fiction? Uh, uh, no, not really. It, without, without finding a deep connection with it with the with the predominant source of energy of that particular age i feel each of the ages uh, the, in each of the ages the production of culture the writing of uh, the writing of fiction has been greatly influenced by the type of energy that has been extracted created or extracted produced and consumed think of dickens and 19th century well 19th century victorian age and and you will be reminded of uh, suit and tallow candles. Think of Lawrence, D.H. Lawrence, and you think of collieries, and you think of coal mining. Think of our modern, the modern petrol, our modern petrol age, and you think of, uh, uh, you know, you think of Cormac McCarthy's The Road. You think of the father and son. It's a post-apocalyptic novel which which tells us the story of of the last survivors on on the on a planet that has been devastated. And the last survivor of our father uh, is a father and a son with a dog. And as they make uh, it, it, you know, in this post-apocalyptic world, what we see are the, uh, is the father and son duo trudging along on a bitumen shattered highway with only an oil company's, and I mean, ironically, with only an oil company's map as their guide. So the point I'm trying to make here is that any, the literature of any age is crucially linked uh, with the energy with the energy consumption and production of that particular age. So, um, so when we think of narratives, both in, in literature and criticism, you know, uh, we do require power, should I say it like this, we do require power to become powerful, for such narratives to become powerful. In recent times, therefore, petrofiction and petrocritical studies are doing precisely that. So that probably, I hope, answers the question, why petro, why petrofiction, why petro narratives? Uh, I've already talked about uh, Helen Havila's oil on water, so I'll skip. I mean, you can, I mean, you know, it's 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 one of the most um, one of the most searing texts written on oil exploitation and its devastating effects on people, society, and environment. And um, it was written in 2010. Uh, most most importantly, this particular novel by Helen Avila sharply brings forth, you know, uh, the 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 terrible impact that oil ex extraction has on the local environment and its carnage, its carnage on the rich wild and on its rich wild and marine life. It sort of exemplifies what um, Patricia Yeager calls uh, the energy, the the resource curse, uh, resource curse. Resource curse. A resource curse is a term used to somehow, you know, uh, sadly, sadly, it's a term used to indicate how resource rich places are precisely those locations which are steeped in poverty and penury. And we are obviously talking about uh, global south countries, third world countries, underdeveloped countries, where uh, whose resource rich reserves have been exploited and uh, have been has been exploited by ever since uh, the, the end of the 19th century. So, fiction such as Helena Bila's Oil on Water and uh, Abdul Rahman uh, Munif's uh, Cities of Salt, I mean, they, they contribute to a toxic discourse. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, you know, that in this narrative, nothing escapes the, toxic, the toxicity of oil. I mean, it turns in Helena Bila's novel, it turns the very soil from, from where it came as a, as, a sort of a, as a sort of a hazard. And moreover, Novels such as Cities of Salt and the Oil and Water show also demonstrate that oil is not simply a material, a rich, a rich material resource. Oil has a social toxic, 
toxicity as well social toxicity because it breeds greed it breeds militancy it breeds corruption it breeds politics it forces people it forces people into warlike and criminal activities in all the hot spots that that have witnessed oil encounters in habila's novel you know militants for example uh, local unemployed youths take to militancy and they kidnap foreign oil workers even though it is a fictional narrative well such incidents are very common in in the niger in the niger delta where oil reserves were for the first time found in the 1950s and 60s and nigeria therefore is a country you know which is the niger delta for example is a place which once which once was thought to be a a promissory note which would promise growth and development for nigeria but unfortunately the greed and corruption and everything that the western powers brought has completely has completely destroyed the local populace the local culture and of course the the its environment so um this is one novel there is i've talked about cities of salt as well what i find interesting i'll give you one more example this time not of a novel but something that i came upon and this is uh, by the very famous italian magic realist and uh, postmodernist writer italo calvino it's a short story written by him way back in 1974 called the petrol pump 1974 especially, especially when you know if you remember 1974 the year was important because it's it came up it came on the backdrop the the story was written by italo calvino on the backdrop of an oil crisis so um you know, a, the opening line, the opening line of this short story is, I, <laughs> it begins with, uh, I, I, should have, I should have thought of it before. It's, it is too late now. This is the narrator. This is the narrator in the story who says, I should have thought of it before. It's too late now. Well, the narrator is actually, the narrator is actually berating himself for not filling up his tank, for not fueling his car. And his initial dilemma, his initial dilemma to fill or not to fill soon soon mutates into a sort of an anguished meditation on modernity itself and that is why i chose this short story by calvino it, it it translates into a meditation and a very very interesting meditation on modernity itself the nature of modernity the scope of modernity a modernity that is fueled by oil a modernity a postmodernity which even as it is fueled by oil is running it's it's running its stock of it's running out of its stock of petrol so the narrator's dilemma in a sense it actually is a, is a symbol for the energy angst the energy angst of we people so it's a very futuristic novel very clairvoyant and very pres prescient in the way in which italo calvino writing this short story 50 years back is able to capture precisely um are empty are empty gas stations um, in calvino's story are they going to be the archetypal metaphor for our current resource anxiety our rapidly depleting resources of petrol you know the why i took up italo calvino's i find that the powerful effect it's it, it sort of uh, the story leaves you with the ironic emission emission and it lingers it lingers and troubles us with with another question uh, what do we do when once our car has bolted from the station and petrol pumps have run dry much like the question that uh, is asked by the documentary a crude awakening that i mentioned in the first part of my talk is oil i'll coming to the last part of my talk I come back to take that question, the question with which I started my talk, is oil cultural? Does it represent, like Frederick Jameson said uh, about cultural capitalism, does it represent the cultural logic of late fossil capi capital? Is oil cultural? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And should, in fact, be the pressing subject of literary writing, more and more literary writing, more and more critical discourses. Friends, today, such narratives that give traction to issues such as climate change, fossil fuel exhaustion, carbon footprint, and global warming, they must be made part of our curriculum. We need more, we need more Greta Thunbergs to launch, 
<laughs> to launch school strikes for climate and planet. And more writers like Habila, more writers like Habila, more writers like uh, Munif and others to stop and undo our destruction of the environment. The texts that I've mentioned in today's talk show us what uh, the green critic, Frederick Buell, not Lawrence, Frederick Buell, describes as, uh, he, he describes our society, the society, the current, the present society that we inhabit is what he calls an exuberant, catastrophic oil society. And um, so writings, uh, narratives such as Habila's Oil on Water or Cal Calvino's The Petrol Pump demonstrate that the era when petrol, when people celebrated, we celebrated, our ancestors, our fathers and grandfathers celebrated the abundance of oil is long overdue, is long gone, sorry, not, it's long gone. Petrofiction, in fact, reveals that the human guzzling, our, our human tendency of guzzling oil cannot go on endlessly. It warns us of a future without fuel, if checks and balances are not installed immediately. And so I'll wrap up by asking, what, if any, is culture theory's role here? What is literature's function here? So it's like, you know, if you, if even to raise a question such as this is to ask what role did novels like Uncle Tom's Cave in or To Kill a Mockingbird play in taking up racism? Do we even have to ask questions? I mean, the answer becomes evident if we remember that Lawrence Buell uh, argues that energy history is intertwined, is, in, is significantly intertwined with culture history. And so the aim of energy humanities, this interdisciplinary new emerging area or area studies is to claim a space for critical literary and artistic engagement. So the critical discourse, friends, on oil has been largely limited to the treatment of oil as a geological, political, economic and corporate substance uh, measured and valued only by petrodollars. But oil's combustible potential needs aesthetic representation in many, many multimedia texts such as uh, such as fiction, non-fiction, films, documentaries, etc. So by asking questions about oil, these narratives, I mean, the, 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 the emerging field of energy humanities, I believe, can help recast the fundamental relationship of our cultural forms to a material, to a material life, which still continues to be dominated by hegemonic forms of, uh, of uh, energy extraction, energy production and consumption. In the end, I feel fiction and non-fiction, the engagement of fiction and non-fiction with oil will be crucial in not only exposing the corporate fetishization of oil, but also in adding pitch, pit and tar to those green voices, to those green voices that say our planet matters. These are uh, the, <laughs> this is the penultimate slide and um, the coordinator is there. So I suppose much like the fuel gate shows that your talk is running on reserve and your time is up. I leave you with this last slide, uh, citing some important critics and texts that I have referred uh, for my talk, for today's talk. And so uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eltai. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Reddy. And thank you, participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Dr. Prantik Banerjee, uh, really wonderful presentation. Uh, very nice presentation, very informative and enlightening and really a new, very new and virgin area for the researchers and for the students as well as the scholars. So uh, our culture is very correlated with the oil and definitely we cannot, uh, we say it is a mandatory essential of our life. So very wonderful presentation, sir. Uh, with your permission, uh, I have few questions from the participants. Uh, the very first question from Satansi, uh, could you please tell me some specific novels uh, or liter literary work for an advanced study. That is the one of the query, one of the participants. Uh, 
for advanced study well i've already actually listed some of the novels uh, some of the uh, some of the fictional works that i mentioned and as i said all you have to do as a young as a researcher is to google petrofiction and there is a whole there's a whole corpus now of writings on petrol particularly emerging not just from places like nigeria or the middle east but also from canada also from canada uh, quebec for example there are uh, in the last 20 years or so quebec has been what we call sand oil sand oil is a is a, is a oil rich reserve that has been found in quebec and um, canadian literature uh, quite a few young writers are writing on uh, once again uh, the the extraction of sand oil and its effect the way in which it is sort of um, taking away some of the traditional modes of livelihood and lifestyles uh, in the last 20 years so if you look up canadian literature also you'll find enough number of examples uh, trinidad and tobago again is a is is a hot spot of oil conflict and uh, that also i don't know whether there is much writing from um, uh, from the Soviet Union, the, uh, or rather from Russia, but uh, uh, you see, Buka is another place that I often read uh, 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 as being a location which is very, very oil rich. The thing is that wherever wherever oil used to be found or is still being found abundantly, these are precisely those kind of locations which have been at the center of geopolitical conflict. And once there is a geopolitical conflict, this is sort of reflected in the writings of writers imbued in that milieu. So I suppose if you can take a look at Canadian literature, Nigerian literature is very rich. A lot of people, young writers in the last 20, 30 years, and a, and a lot of social uh, environmental activist writing has also emerged from Nigeria, including that of Ken Seroviva. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is uh, from the participants. Oil being a depleting resources, can we expect that Plato fiction will fuel the genre on global sustainability through the renewable energy narratives? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, uh, writings on oil, whether they are imaginative fiction, whether they are imaginative narratives, uh, play a crucial role in engaging and keeping the discourse alive. So, uh, petrofiction will play a very, petrofiction has and will continue to play a, 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 a very important role. You know, petrofiction, when I say petrofiction, well, it's only one subgenre within the broader area of uh, of energy humanities. There are, there are other critics and scholars who actually talk about um, uh, what they call extraction fiction. Extraction fiction, which looks at the history, the history of human exploitation of resources. Like I said, if you, if you think of the timeline, literary timelines, and go back to even Victorian literature or even before that, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to do a kind of a new historicist reading of how the energy resources of that of a particular age or a particular decade has had a, a, an influence on the kind of writings that have emerged. Okay, sir. The last query, uh, which is asked by Dr. Jaden Patil, uh, have any creative writers written literature in Arabic with this topic? In fact, uh, Abdul Rahman Munif's uh, writings, The Cities of Sol, um, it, it's a series of, of, it's a quintet, it's a series of uh, novels, are, have been written in Arabic. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Munif himself was a chemical engineer working for an American oil company before he, uh, you know, uh, he, he was so dismayed by what he was seeing, the kind of tran radical transfor transformation that was taking place to the Saudi Arabian society. I mean, in interviews, he's been very, very forthright in his, in his trenchant criticism of the Saudi Arabia regime by suggesting that in the 60s, in the 50s and the 60s, this was the moment which could have been a game changer, the finding of oil basins, oil rich basins in the deserts of Saudi Arabia should have been the trunk, should have been the turning point in, 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 in for the growth and development of Saudi Arabia. But unfortunately, yes, it created wealth, yet it, it yes, it created a huge mega petrodollar industry. Yes, it created uh, the, it, it invited American, American interest and intervention, including as you and I are familiar with military intervention in the form of not one, but three, two Gulf Wars. All of this has happened, 
has been written by Munir and many other Saudi Arabian writers in their language. What is uh, interesting, what is interesting, sir, if I may also add, is uh, to perhaps look beyond literary texts because uh, media texts, media narratives, particularly graphic fiction, for instance, right, or even installation art that I had shown in one of my slides, visual narratives have become much more prominent in throwing up these, in engaging and throwing up with these issues related to not just the burning of, uh, of a limited energy resource, but also, but also for promoting environmental justice, environmental social justice, environmental justice, and uh, and uh, economic equality. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Really very fruitful session. Uh, you provided the oil for the researchers and scholars, really, <laughs> in, the, in that true sense. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Um, I extend my thanks to Dr. Reddy and Eltai Khande chapter uh, head, Dr. Vaibhav Sabnis, thank you very much for this wonderful session. Now, thank over to Dr. Reddy. Thank you, Dr. Heman Patel, for moderating the session so well. Thank you. Uh, Reddy, sir, you are on mute. Uh, can you please unmute and speak? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patil, and uh, thank you, Dr. Benerji, sir, for your uh, enlightening uh, uh, talk on the topic. And dear participants, uh, uh, here is the poster for the next week's webinar. It is on uh, instructional design and content development. The resource person is Dr. A.R. Bhavana, Associate Professor and Head in Charge, Department of Educational Technology, Bhartiyar University, Coimbatore. And uh, we have moderators for this session, Dr. Ram Bishay from uh, Mumbai chapter and Rajesh uh, Yoli uh, from Mumbai chapter. Both of them, they are going to moderate the session next week. We request all the participants to uh, register and attend to this uh, webinar next week. Uh, apart from that, I uh, would like to um, bring to your kind notice that uh, LTI is organizing its uh, international annual conference in the uh, second part of November. That is two weekends. Two weekends in the second part of November, uh, LTI International Conference is being organized. So the details are available in the LTI website. Um, we request each and every participant to just, just check with the website for the details of LTI's international conference uh, in the November second part. Uh, thank you one and all for uh, your uh, wonderful participation and uh, involving with the questions. So, thank you one and all the resource persons and the participants and the organizing committee members. So thank you all, have a nice day. We'll meet meeting in the next week webinar. Thank you all.